song. You remember when they made that video, Jim? No? No, all right. <laughs> I'm not sure when that song was made, but it was probably a little bit before you and I. But uh, I remember my dad listening to it when I was uh, growing up. Uh, I played it for you this morning because it kind of fits in nicely with our uh, sermon series, The Real Teachings of Jesus. Uh, we have been for the last couple weeks, and will be for a while, just going through the red letters of the book of Matthew and uh, taking a look at the teachings of Jesus. And we started a couple weeks ago, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount started with the Beatitudes, the blessed are those who do this, blessed are those who do that. And then last week we heard the message on salt and uh, light and what that meant. And uh, this morning we want to pick up and continue with that uh, Sermon on the Mount. And in, in today's message, Jesus is really talking about the law and applications of the law. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue looking at the true teachings of Jesus. Bless you. The first section we're going to take a look at here is Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to pick up in verse 17, and we're going to take a look through about verse 20. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you that until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter... Not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and surpasses that of the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. All right, this is a, a kind of a difficult passage, a uh, whole section, really, what I'm going to be teaching today is kind of a difficult section to preach. Um, a, a lot of people would have you to believe that Jesus came and he abolished the law, but Jesus makes it very clear at the start of his ministry, I haven't come to abolish it, but I've come to fulfill it. Now, what's the difference between abolishing the law and fulfilling it? Well, Jesus fulfilled it in that he lived the law perfectly and completely. He obeyed the law in every way. But he does not abolish it. He does not remove it from uh, our lives. He does not say that it no longer applies to us. In fact, he says just the opposite. He says, look at verse 18 again. For truly I tell you that until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen. If you look at a more literal translation, it probably says not, not a yod, not, not a tittle. Not a jot or a tittle will be uh, removed from the law. Uh, the, the jot, uh, a yod, it's, it's the character in the alphabet that's the smallest of all the characters. A tittle is a, a line that helps you differentiate between one word and another. You can think of it in the difference between like an English L and a T. It's just that line that goes across the top that helps us to distinguish one for the, for the other. So what Jesus is saying is, I haven't come to abolish it and, uh, until heaven and earth disappear. This law remains. It, and not even the smallest part of it is to be removed. I've not come to abolish it. I've come to fulfill it. And then he goes on and it presses the issue even a little bit further. And he, and he helps us to understand that the obeying of the law not only affects the life in which we live uh, in, in this life, but the next. And in case you're kind of not familiar with what the church lingo is, what is law? Well, law is the same. I mean, it's a series of commands, the do's and the don'ts. It's beyond the Ten Commandments. The, 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 the Bible's filled with all different kind of commands. And in the same way that, that we know that we shouldn't steal uh, in society, we shouldn't speak in society. Um, we shouldn't do this and that. We have laws of the land. God had his own laws. Jesus doesn't abolish them. He fulfills them. And he says, therefore, though, verse 19, anyone who will set aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly are going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Even if you take one of the more minor laws, if, if you minimize it, if you say it doesn't apply, if you live like it doesn't apply, and if you teach others that it doesn't apply, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what do we do with this? We believe as Christians um, that we're saved uh, apart from our own works, and that is uh, certainly true. 
uh, we're saved by, by the works of Jesus, not our own. But with that being said, God says the law remains. Jesus says the law remains. And what, what, what is he saying when he says if, if, you, if you minimize these commandments, uh, basically uh, you'll be called least in heaven. And, and if you follow them and teach others to follow them, you'll be called great. Um, you know, the older generation, like I remember my grandma and so forth, they would talk about this as almost like rewards, right? Uh, and they would have this phrase, and I know some of you have heard it, uh, receiving another jewel in the crown. And I'm, I'm familiar with people understanding what Jesus is saying in that light, but I don't know that I, I like that as the best explanation for it. Um, I guess I tend to think of it more in terms of a position uh, in heaven rather than a, a reward per se. What I mean by that is in life we have all different positions. Some people are teachers and some people are students. Um, some people are doctors, some people are patients. Um, just because we have different positions of authority in this world doesn't make it inherently evil or bad or wrong as long as those people are exercising those positions rightly. Boss, employee, okay? Well, heaven's going to be that same way. In fact, we see when we look at the angelic realm, you have angels, but you have archangels. You have angels that are over angels. And so as we understand this passage and what Jesus is saying, I think we've got to be careful about not get falling into this works righteousness thing about doing something for a reward because if we do that we nullify really what it is Jesus is saying because our heart's not right in other words some preachers will go and they'll really emphasize that well you should tithe because if you tithe God blesses you well the scripture says God does bless that but you're not going to hear me teach that because if that's the reason you're doing it then your heart's in the wrong place and you shouldn't be doing it anyways the reason I tithe is out of obedience, not because of what I might get from it. The same thing with this. I'm not worried about you know, what I'm going to get by still obeying and following the law, but I'm worried about trying to follow it the best that I humanly can because the reality is, is that's what obedience to God means, and Jesus says that must still continue. And you know, some people get really, um, really hung up about the, this whole talk about the law, but I'm here to tell you, I'm I like, uh, I like the law. Even though I can never live up to it, I cannot live to it completely and perfectly, the reality is, is the law is here to guide our lives. And if, if you were going to take a hike across a mountain range, wouldn't you like to have a guide by which you can get through that mountain range with the, less, the least amount of difficulty? And you guys are doing the same thing that they did in early service. Thank you. I see one nod there. The rest of you don't care. You'd just rather take the... The approach that gives you the more frostbite, the more, you know, cliffs and what? No, of course. We want the path that, that would be the easiest to cross. That's what the law is. God says, I have made the world to work this way. This is what right is. This is what wrong is. Follow these statutes. Follow these commands, and your life will be better than what they will be if you don't follow it. So to me, the law is just, it's a beautiful thing. But there's a reason I played for you the song, I Fought the Law and the Law won. None of us in here can beat the law. Jesus' last words in that section, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, and even the expert, the teachers of the law, unless you can live according to the law better than them, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What? What do we do with that? I mean, the, the Pharisees, the teachers, the experts of the law, they were the best at following the law. And Jesus is now saying, if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we've got to do better than that. Well, the point is, is you fought the law, and the law is going to win. You're not going to win. You see, we're not saved by the fact that of our own efforts. We're saved because Jesus fulfilled the law. We're saved through his works. We're saved through his blood. But that doesn't abolish the law. And you need to hear that because your preachers your whole life probably hadn't told you that. I'm not preaching works righteousness here. I'm not teaching works righteousness. We are all justified by the work of Christ, not ourselves. But hear this, because these are the true teachings of Jesus. Jesus says the law has not disappeared. And he still calls for us to follow it and to obey it, even if we're not justified by it. Did everyone hear that the right way? The rest of you? Do I need to go back and re-preach that section? It was kind of long. I'm not saying you're saved by your works. You're absolutely not. But stop in your mind trying to abolish the law because it hasn't been abolished. And it's a beautiful thing. It guides our lives. 
It makes our lives easier than what they would otherwise be. All right, Matthew 5, 21 to 22. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, which is answerable then to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. I remember being confirmation age and picking up my Bible and reading it, uh, either for an assignment or just for pleasure. And I remember reading that, and I had not come across that passage before. And I, I was a little concerned. I was pretty sure that I probably had used that word fool before, and I hated to think that um, I was in danger of the fires of hell. Now, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law really thought that they had the ability to obey the law completely. And so as Jesus is starting his ministry, he's trying to teach his disciples and others, we can't. That's why he had to come to fulfill the law. That's why he had to die. If we could obey the law completely, Jesus would have never had to come into this earth and and, and to live according to the law and to die for us. But we can't obey it completely. So he takes the understanding of the law and says, you've heard it said you can't kill people. Well, that's not just about putting your hands around someone's neck and, and squeezing them and choking them out until they turn a different color and stop breathing. He says, in fact, it's really more about a matter of the heart. That it's what your heart feels towards someone that can cause you really to be guilty of murder, even though you have not physically acted on it in terms of words or through your hands or what have you. And when I was writing this on Monday, it was fresh in my mind, a soccer game that I coached uh, Saturday, uh, a week ago from yesterday, in which um, it's really clear to me that sometimes we can mask the outer actions, but yet the heart is in a different place. We were, uh, we were playing this team, and uh, <coughs> it happened to be my son, but I can promise you if it was any kid on my team, I would have reacted the same way. But my son had uh, kind of stuffed this one person and beat him. Then he beat this other person really bad with a soccer ball. And he, he didn't have anyone in front of him, so he kind of led the soccer ball out a couple feet in front of him, and he's just running full speed after it. And this kid comes up behind him, isn't anywhere near the ball, never makes a play in the ball, and just kicks across my son's feet when he's running full speed. And Matthew just goes tumbling, and he's hurt. And I can tell that he's really hurt. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty upset at what I just saw. I don't care if someone tries to make a good play on the ball, but this kid clearly didn't. Now, I wasn't actually mad at the kid because the kid's just a kid, and the kid has to learn. But I was mad at the officials because all the official did was blew his whistle and pointed like it was no big deal, like it was some ordinary foul. And so I'm running out there to go check on Matthew, who's still down on the field, and as much as an eighth grade boy is trying to not look uncool when he's hurt, you know, he's trying to, you know, not show that he's hurt as bad as he is, and and I'm trying to check on him, but but I become less concerned about him, and I become more concerned about that, that, that ref, who all he's doing is just blowing his whistle and pointing, like he thinks that that should somehow satisfy my anger at the situation. And I start really kind of chewing on this guy, and, and I'm getting more frustrated because this is, in all honesty, the guy no, could, could not speak English. And so as I'm trying to express my displeasure to this individual because he's not saying something to the kid, saying something to the coach, making the kid leave the game so that the kid can understand that you can't play that way because you can cause harm to someone as he's just looking at me totally clueless and I'm just getting more and more frustrated because you're, you know, as a person getting frustrated, you want to see a little reaction out of the person you're talking to. And, and I was trying my best to kind of hold back what my true feelings were, but apparently I wasn't doing a great job at it because one of the parents came up to me after the game, and I've coached this team for 10 years, and he's like, well, we hadn't seen that in the last 10 years. But as I'm sitting there chewing on him, I, and he's not responding, I'm finding myself more angry at him, and honestly, I'm wanting to start cussing the guy out. But I know he's not going to understand it even if I'm doing it. And then, honestly, part of me wants to start swinging at this guy. And I'm like, no, that's stupid. And I'm thinking, how about like a Billy Martin? Remember Billy Martin from the Yankees? He'd run out with his chest out and just kind of bump the refs. You know how they do that in baseball? And I want to at least get a little bump on this guy. But I didn't. I didn't cuss at him. I didn't touch him. But man, I wanted to. This is what Jesus is saying. You can mask the outer 
actions, but just because you don't have your hands around someone's neck, squeezing them till they turn blue, doesn't mean you're not guilty of murder. It's what's in the heart that leads to that. It's what the heart that matters. And he forbids the use of this term raka, which is uh, a derogatory term that was used in its day, and it referred to the person as the empty one. And to speak of any creation of God, someone who's been made in the image of God as an empty one, you can understand how offensive that is to God. And then the word fool, you fool, it, the word fool is really uh, describes someone that is utterly void of any value. And Jesus said those words are as murder itself. Immediately after this section where Jesus is helping them to redefine their understanding of, of what breaking a command is and what murder is, he goes and he talks about then forgiveness, Matthew 5, 23 to 26. Therefore, if you're offering the gift at the altar, and there then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you need to, you need to lift your, leave your gift right there in front of the altar. And you must first go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. In fact, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together and you're on your way to court, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge might hand you over to the officer, and you might be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get, it. You will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Now, this is kind of addressing two different things here. The one, if you're someone who's uh, caused grievance to another, you need to go apologize for that. You need to go make that right before that ever even gets to the court. But the other thing that's being talked about here is how, the attitude we deal with each other in conflict. Some of us in here are people that hold grudges. And it speaks about if you're coming on your way before the altar to give a gift, don't bother giving that gift to God because that gift's not going to mean anything if you're holding a grudge against a brother or sister. You need to go make right with them before you come before the altar. You can think of that same thing in terms of communion. Maybe some of us come up here and receive communion earlier today and we're unwilling to forgive another person for something that was done. Well, we don't have really any business taking communion in that situation because we're trying to receive the forgiveness of God when we're not willing to extend it to another person. There's really not a reason to be hot-headed and to hold grudges. I mean, it can happen in the heat of a moment, but we need to be willing to let it go. And we need to be real... We need to be slow to anger. We need to be as God is abounding in love. For some of us that are hot-headed, we need to realize, you know what? We're not perfect. We need to just get over whatever someone does to us and stop expecting the people around us to be perfect. Because if we're not perfect, certainly the people around us cannot be expected to be perfect either. Matthew 5, 27 to 30. He said, you have heard it said, Jesus said, that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than to have your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Now, these true teachings of Jesus are really kind of getting in the way, aren't they? What do we do with this? I mean, we, people like to kind of rationalize the way that, we, that Jesus has abolished law, but he said he hasn't. Now, when Jesus is talking here, I mean, is he just talking rhetorically here, or is he really talking that, you know, we should, like, gouge out eyes and cut off hands and so forth? Listen, I'm going to take Jesus at his face value that he said it's better for you to lose an eye than to have your whole body thrown into hell and it's better for you not to lose a hand than to have the whole body thrown into hell but i prefer not to gouge out one of my eyes and i prefer not to cut off one of my hands so what do we do well maybe we try to not commit the sin and not just the actual act, but Jesus says, you know, having this in your heart. Maybe by God's Spirit, we try to change the way that we perceive and understand people of the opposite sex. I only understand this through the eyes of guys, but I'm guessing as, uh, there's some girls that have trouble with this as well. But guys, I would suggest to you, rather than plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand, that maybe when you talk to someone of the opposite sex, you just 
kind of look at the person's face. Now there's a thought. And I don't know if I intentionally at some point started to do, do this or if I'm just not the most observant person in the world. Maybe a little bit of both. But I very seldom don't ever really notice anything other than the person's face. In fact, I felt kind of like an idiot the other day. Uh, it was pajama day or something for uh, the preschoolers and the teachers. And I was sitting there talking to the teacher for a couple minutes before I even realized she had pajamas on. My eyes just didn't make it down there. I'm looking at the face. Maybe, maybe it's not best, especially for, probably not for any of us, but especially if we might struggle with loss. You know, I'm just thinking, but probably, probably good that we don't have the movie channel in our house. I remember, it was either third or fourth grade, I can't tell you which, but I know where I was living. But the greatest day in my young life is when I came home from school one day. Mom wasn't home, we lived in an apartment, and I turned on the TV, and there was some serious flesh going on, and I was introduced to the movie channel. Oh, that was some interesting stuff. Also in the 70s back then, I guess stuff like this wasn't uncommon, but there's this hollowed out van that was right there to the side of the apartment complex, and every time you went into the van, there's a nice stack of adult magazines in there. So as a third or fourth grader, I was indoctrinated into uh, sins of the flesh and to see things. And that, that affects how you perceive the world. It affects how you perceive people. But the reality is, is at some point in my life as I matured, and, and certainly in my, my younger years, um, I guess I improved beyond where I was in third and fourth grade, uh, I began to understand that this type of behavior was not an appropriate thing. And so... By the time I hit adulthood, I made it a point that, you know, I wouldn't have movie channels. I wouldn't go to those sites on, on the internet. I'd rather keep both my eyes. They're more important to me than that other junk. Frankly, I'd rather keep my hand. It's way more important to me than that other stuff. But I don't nullify and I don't take away what Jesus' words are by his spirit as much as humanly as I can. I try to just be in obedience to his law, which he's told me in his word, that not even the smallest part of it has been removed. But the problem is, is it's such a difficult thing because we're in a society that promotes sexuality so much that even in churches, I remember a couple years ago, uh, if it was that long ago, but that local church where they were doing the sermon series on, on sexuality and it was about... Uh, man and wife, but, you know, to kind of make it all uh, uh, hyped up and centralized, the pastor and his wife slept on the roof and lived on the roof of the church for like a week or a month or something like that, and it's just crazy. But that's, that's the world in which you and I live. But Jesus says, adultery, even as murder, is an issue of the heart. By God's spirit, we can fight against that and battle against it, but it's a battle. And you're not going to be perfect all the time, but it's a battle. And battles mean you've got to try. Not just dismiss, huh? <laughs> He's abolished the law. He hasn't. Now, if we've been personal up to this point, here's where it gets really sticky. And honestly, like, if... It's easier to pick and choose Jesus' words. It's a whole lot harder to preach the way I'm going to be preaching to you guys over the next few months where we're just reading all of his words. Matthew 5, 31 to 32. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. These words of Jesus are just beyond our ability to comprehend because as a society, we have just changed so much, okay? My parents divorced, and, and, and listen, what I'm about to say is always, guys, I'm not casting stones. Some of us, we all mess up against the law. But my mom's on her third marriage, and, and I love her dearly. But I can't change the words of Jesus because I love my mom, okay? But when my parents divorced, 70, 80-ish, somewhere around there, probably about 80. There was a change in the law to where now there was things called no-fault divorces. 
But you and I can't wrap our minds around the fact that if you go back far enough in American history, there was a time in which the government understood marriage as an institution of God, and you couldn't, you couldn't just divorce someone because you're tired of being married to them. And so starting around that time, late 70s or whenever it was, now there's this thing called no-fault divorce, which means that you don't really have to have a reason. If you're tired of being married to the person and you've got the money to pay the attorneys and to do the appropriate court proceedings, you can go ahead and get a divorce. So marriage then became not this institution from God, which was supposed to be for life, but it now became kind of this legal, contractual, um, long-term dating. problem with it, and the reason Jesus speaks so firmly against it is, it is incredibly painful to go through a divorce. Jesus says when two people are married, the two become one. And I can tell you as a kid who had to go through that divorce and to see uh, my mom and dad separate, to see my mom move 2,000 miles away from my dad with another man, to have my brother then stay back there with my dad, to grow up apart from my brother, to now, even to this point, my dad, around seven years old, I've never had the close relationship with my dad that I otherwise could, because really from eight years old on, I've never really been around him much, except a couple weeks, a year tops. I understand and I recognize that this is incredibly painful. And so, for those of you who have already gone through a divorce, and statistically I understand who I'm talking to, it's probably 40%, maybe upwards of 50% of us in here. I can't control where you've been. And in the end, we all fail when it comes to the law of God, and we all have to rely on the work of Jesus rather than our own. But I'm here to tell all of you who are in a marriage now, God hates divorce. His law, his commands forbid it, except for the, the exception that's mentioned here. And if we have any desire to see our children and our children's children's generations be better, we can't just ignore the parts of the law that we fail in. Because it's, if you're like me, if I fail in a part of the law, I'd rather just not even acknowledge it's there. Because every time I look at it, I'm confronted with my own sin. But that's okay, because we have to look at the blood of Jesus. Because that's where we find our worth before God. But the reality is, is... By ignoring that part of the law, we doom onto our children the same failures that we have experienced and our parents have experienced. And we can save them from that hurt and that pain by at least at this point in our lives, wherever we're at, taking a stand on it. And not only uh, teaching them what the Bible says, but showing them by example. And for any children who might be in here, let me tell you, Sometimes we get married because, well, we just don't want to be alone. Sometimes we get married because we think someone's cool or fun, but these aren't the reasons that we're to get married. We get married before the eyes of the Almighty God when we commit and choose to have this person to be our spouse for better or for worse. And that is how you need to make your decision before you choose the person that you marry, because it's to be a lifelong decision. Then the last section we want to look at today, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Jesus says, again, you have heard it said that people long ago said, don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But Jesus turns us around. He says, I tell you the truth. Do not swear on an oath at all. In fact, don't swear by heaven. Because that's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth. That's God's footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head. You're nothing. You can't even make one hair white or one hair black. I guess that was before hair color. But all you need to say simply is yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the devil, from the e evil one. Now, this is an interesting one because in our culture, um, there's always oath of office, right? Um, as you were before a, a jury, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. And I've heard that, and I don't know, but in many places, this stuff's being replaced because we're becoming a non-religious society. And who knows, maybe it's a good thing because Jesus is pretty clear that our yes should be yes and our no should be no. We shouldn't take oaths before God. But I think we've got to be careful not to read too deeply into that because we actually have examples in Scripture 
where Jesus is before the high priest, and he says, I want you to swear by the, by the Almighty God himself, are you who you claim to be? And Jesus answers him. And the Apostle Paul says, as God is my witness, he, 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 he declares these truths as he's known them. So whether or not Jesus is really telling us that in the face of government officials and, and, and oaths of office and stuff that we can't uh, make an oath, that is somewhat debatable by Scripture. But what is pretty clear is that, you know, what, we, what I always did as a kid when you wanted to convince someone you're telling the truth was, I swear to God. No, you don't do that. Because one, you're making a promise on the name of God and to God, and if you don't follow through on it, you're not just breaking your promise to that individual, but you're doing it to God himself. You're, you're taking God's name in vain. But then the second thing is your reputation and your character should be such that your yes means yes, and your no means no, and that should be good enough. I was utterly amazed for a service that people were even talking to me on the way out. This is filled with minefields as a pastor. It would be much easier for me to be like most of the pastors who won't touch these topics, but ain't going to do it. I care too much about you, and I care too much about the God that I serve to dismiss his words. And then someone else said to me on the way out, wow, you got, you got all of us one way or the other in today's message. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. For all of us sin and all of us fall short. We are not justified by our own actions. We all fail miserably when we, when we compare ourselves to the law of God. And that's okay, because that's why we have the blood of Jesus, who has fulfilled the law. He just hasn't abolished it. And by his spirit, know his words, know his law. And by his spirit, try to follow it as much as you humanly can, humanly possibly can. These are the real teachings of Jesus, not a lot of that other stuff that you like to hear or that you hear from other people. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, as we hear these words, I pray that we would not ignore them being in the Bible because they convict us of our sin and they make us feel uncomfortable. Help us to own our sin. Help us to learn from our failings. Help us to try to improve each and every day of our lives by your spirit and help us never forget that which is impossible for man is possible with God and thanks be to God through Christ Jesus he has fulfilled the law and it is his blood justifies and not our own in his holy and precious name we pray amen now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore amen